Here in Australia, our theme parks are back to normal. Well, kind of back to normal. I'm Dan from ThemeParkNut.com and today we're going to talk about what theme parks will be like after COVID. I haven't spent a lot of time on my channel really talking about COVID um, for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, in Australia, we've been incredibly lucky and we're quite aware of that. Uh, I don't want to be sitting here gloating about the fact that we can go to theme parks when I know a lot of the other people around the world can't even leave their houses. So, um, we know we've been lucky and we don't want to rub it in anyone's faces. Um, secondly, there are a lot of parts of the world where this pandemic's become a very divisive political tool, for want of a better word. Um, and it's very hard to extrapolate out the issues associated with the pandemic from the politicisation of it. I guess both of those things have sort of played into the fact that I, I haven't felt like really sharing anything about any of our trips to our local theme parks here in Australia, which have been open for some time. But if we are truly globally moving into a post-COVID world, then I think it's probably worth covering what it's been like at the Australian theme parks, since we already kind of are living in a post-COVID world. Let's get some stats out of the way first. So since the start of the pandemic in the start of 2020, Australia has had just over 29,000 cases of the coronavirus. Uh, which is about 0.1%-ish of our 25 million uh, people. Uh, of those cases, there's been 909 deaths. Uh, in Queensland, we've only had six deaths. Uh, in Queensland, we're the third largest state. Um, we're twice the size of Texas. So six deaths is a, is a pretty happy result um, for a global pandemic. Currently, Australia has 90 active cases, uh, and all those cases are coming from essentially overseas sources. Our, our, our breakout events that have happened um, have tended to come from either people who were traveling overseas or from people who were helping with the quarantine of people that were traveling overseas. Uh, we've had no community transmissions at all for the last, I think, two weeks or so. Um, so things are going really well in Australia in terms of the coronavirus. And I just want to say Australia was incredibly lucky with this pandemic. Uh, our remoteness basically meant that um, when global community sort of realised the, the true danger of this virus, we were still in the really early days of community transmission. The second thing that really worked in Australia's favour is that we had a very uh, fast and hard shutdown. In March and April last year, we basically went into a nationwide shutdown uh, for about three months. It differed slightly depending on where you lived. Importantly, this move was supported by both sides of politics and at all levels of government. While I don't always agree with the current uh, federal government, which is a fairly conservative government, uh, like the Republicans in the US. They did do a really good job here of supporting all of the measures that people wanted to put in place and financially backing a number of the measures. We had strict border controls which came into effect very, very fast and we continue to have a mandatory two-week quarantine process for all new arrivals, whether they be Australian citizens or, or uh, overseas travellers. Internally, a number of the states, particularly those like Queensland that had very, very low numbers initially, shut their borders to other states. And while this has been very, very difficult, and particularly for states like us that were reliant on tourism, um, this definitely slowed the spread of the virus. Australia's strategy for the coronavirus started out as a suppression strategy. We wanted to just keep the numbers as low as possible, keep our hospitals able to cope with it. Um, once we had some pretty good success and the numbers started to drop much faster than people anticipated, we basically moved to an elimination strategy similar to our friends in New Zealand. Um, now we're at the point where life is largely 
completely back to normal. There is the occasional, uh, what our media di uh, calls circuit breaker lockdowns, uh, which are sort of between four and six day lockdowns. Um, when there's a chance of community transmission, particularly of particular strains of the virus. We've been super lucky here that we're, our cases are so few that we've been able to trace uh, effectively every case. They know where every case has come from. And it means that they've been able to keep an eye and sometimes preemptively shut down when they've seen the uh, sort of hyper contagious strains that have come out of the UK, South Africa, and now Russia. So practically no cases means everything is just totally back to normal, right? Well, no. No, it's not. All of our theme parks are now open and in Queensland they've returned to running at full capacity. But there are things that have changed. And there are some things that are probably have changed forever. So let's run through what's new. Firstly, contact tracing forms. All Australian theme parks are required to provide contact tracing information to their relevant state governments. So this has been implemented in a number of ways, uh, most commonly by forms that are completed on entry, and this is consistent with other um, establishments around Australia. It's a bit different between our two major theme park chains. Dreamworld's being very strict on everyone fills out the same form that goes off to their website, you do it on your mobile phone, you have to prove it before you even get up to the turnstiles to buy your tickets. Well, which results into a little bit of queuing before doing the app, but it largely works. Uh, Village Roadshow, who run uh, Movie World and SeaWorld, our, our other two big parks here in uh, Queensland, they have uh, an online app, the Village Roadshow app, which they use for this purpose and allow you to basically prove who you are in the app and then use that as your ticket into the park. The app is by far and away the best way to manage this process. Uh, the only place that it really falls down is if people don't have smartphones, um, which is getting more rare, but obviously they have backup processes for when that happens. The app also gives us our second real change that's come into account, with um, virtual queuing being something that's now possible for free. Now there's been paid mechanisms for virtual queuing in both of the parks for a long time, but obviously that's driven by profit, not trying to keep people out of the queues. This is the first time that any Australian park has seriously tried to um, limit the number of people that are queuing up for rides. And I'm gonna be honest, uh, it's not being utilized very heavily. So you're still seeing significant standby waits for a number of attractions at Movie World and SeaWorld. And Dreamworld, they don't have anything. Everything is standby in Dreamworld. So don't expect that when the coronavirus ends, there's gonna be no standby lines. I don't think that'll be the case. It's certainly not the case here in Australia. But it's really good to have some more options. Another change is there's hand sanitizing stations pretty much everywhere, on entrance and exits to every ride, on main streets, near restaurants. Now, are people using them? Well, not as much as they used to, let's put it that way. There's a lot of complacency in the Australian uh, population at the moment. So, no, they aren't being used a heck of a lot, but it's good to know that they're there, right? If you're concerned about something you can use them they're readily available and that's a really good thing and a big plus that's come in now is scheduled ride sanitation so it's not uh, between every single cycle and so it's not going to stop every single germ but from what I've seen depending on which park you're in between every half hour and every hour the rides literally stop and they clean disinfect top to bottom all of the touch points on the ride vehicles which you know, means they're significantly less germy than they were before this pandemic. The final big plus is that we're now seeing crowd spacing in the shows. It's now become standard to force space, two seats, three seats, between parties in all indoor theater attractions. So Movie World's Roxy Theater and Dream World Sky Voyager. And I love it because I hate the idea of some weirdo stranger right up against me. However, it is really crippling to the capacity of Sky Voyager in particular because effectively there are eight people gondolas uh, or ten people gondolas 
and you're playing a game where you're sitting a group of five trying to leave two spaces you're often getting one group per gondola and that's just not very efficient Now, let's also talk about what you might expect has changed, but actually hasn't. I said earlier that you shouldn't expect that uh, standby queues are going to disappear, and sadly, you should also expect that people won't respect social distancing in those queues either. While walking around the park, people are pretty good at leaving each other sufficient space. Once you get into a queue, it seems, at least for now in Australia, all bets are off. Most people will respect it if you point it out or if you ask for some more room. People are quite used to it, but they don't think about it when they get into the queue. So even though the signs are there and the markings are on the floor, people really aren't leaving that space unless they're really told to. Another thing people might think overseas uh, is that the parks have come back and said masks are mandatory. Everyone needs to be wearing a mask. Nope, not in the slightest. Now people are welcome to use masks and I've certainly seen the odd guest wearing masks around the park but in general no one's wearing masks at all. Now to be fair, particularly in South East Queensland we've only had one uh, three day, four day period that um, masks were legally mandated by law that you couldn't go outside without wearing a mask uh, during one of our snap lockdowns but uh, I don't know if other places in the world are going to be any better than us, to be perfectly honest. Once that's not a requirement, people are maybe not going to wear them as much. But certainly here, where they've never really been forced to wear them, there's just, there's just no one doing it. No guests, no staff. It's just not part of going to a theme park here in Australia at the moment. And I think that'll be different in other places. I really do. I think in the US, I think culture has shifted. There are a lot of people that will wear masks to theme parks forever in the future in the US from what I can see. But there's a lot of people that can't wait to rip those things off and never use them again. So, like I said, masks being mandatory, don't expect it. It's not necessarily going to be the case, but your local legislation is what's going to drive those mandates. Another thing that's not really happening here at all is leaving empty rows on rides. We're basically filling rides to capacity again here in Australia. Now occasionally they'll leave an empty seat, like if you've got a group of three going into a ride vehicle that's full, they won't try and fill in that last spot, which they might have pre-pandemic, but in general, if you've got a group of two and another group of two, you're going to go in the same vehicle. You're not going to be spaced out. So. Um, yeah, I can't see that being something that's maintained overseas either, so be, be prepared for that. The other thing that really hasn't changed, which I thought might have, is the ability to use cash inside the parks. Now there are signs everywhere when you're trying to pay for anything that say that um, non-contact touch pay um, payment is preferred, but it's not mandated. Right? They, they can't refuse cash and they won't refuse cash. And uh, honestly, from talking to a cashier, uh, who I actually apologised because I had to pay cash to, she said, look, if, if I was worried about that, I wouldn't be working in a theme park. There, there's a lot of people that are very pragmatic about the fact that these environments are risky. Um, so, yeah, adding a tiny bit of risk around the fact that people use cash is not going to be a big deal. In Australia, it's not going to be a big deal. Now, Australia was largely already a card-based society. We weren't a cash-based society. So you probably, in the US, think that's slightly strange, but we were already probably using uh, 70, 80% of our transactions via tap-and-go card, um, credit cards, debit cards, that sort of thing. So it's not very weird for us to do that anyway. So I don't think there's been as much push to stop cash, if that makes sense. But again, US might be different in that case, um, but certainly here in Australia, you can still pay cash, nobody cares. So let's get on to the permanent. Well, time will tell whether these are permanent changes uh, to the theme parks. Firstly, getting up close and personal with characters. 
all the meet and greets in all the parks that we've been to since uh, the pandemic reopenings um, have continued and continue up until this day to socially distance their meet and greets. So characters back here, guests in front. Um, they do it in a variety of ways uh, and they do it in, in some really clever ways. There's, there's some really good staged photos that are going on at um, Movie World and Dream World um, around their characters, but you can't hug them, you can't give them a high five, all the things you used to be able to do before um, before the pandemic, you can't do with characters anymore. And given how long we've been sort of fairly clear of transmissions, like we're talking probably six months that they haven't really considered that a factor in our parks, I don't think it's going to change. I think the new normal is staging photos so that the actors don't have to touch people. Um, probably not a horrible thing. Now the last thing that I think is gone from theme parks at least is buffet restaurants. Both Dreamworld and Movie World had sort of signature buffet restaurants which were of varying quality I gotta admit but they're both closed. They've been closed since the start of the reopenings and there are no signs of reopening. There are literally none. Uh, if anything there could be signs that some of them or one of them might be disappearing entirely. So I think some of these may come, come back as table service or they may get reused for another purpose but at the moment I don't think there's going to be any buffet restaurants in any Australian theme parks in the next 10 years. Look, Australia is in a fairly unique position in terms of this pandemic, so I'm not saying that everything that's happening here is going to be what happens in the US or the UK, but I might give you guys a little bit of a frame of reference. Certainly when your local park does open in the US, the UK, in Europe, it's going to be very specific on what it can do based on its local legislation. It, it's not going to be one rule for all theme parks around the world because all these individual jurisdictions will have particular controls on parks being able to reopen. But as this vaccine does take off, we're going to see things reopen and reopen fully. Uh, there's things going around at the moment that Disneyland may open as soon as April uh, in some operational capacity. So it's really exciting for us theme park people to have this back. But I just want to temper your expectations just a little. Reopening doesn't mean things are going back the way they were. Things will change. And I think some things are going to change for good. So you've got to be aware of that. And if I'm totally honest, my opinion is that the changes the minor, minor sacrifices that are coming in for the betterment of greater public health are a drop in the ocean. They're really nothing. If that's going to turn you off going back to a theme park but you can't go to a buffet restaurant and hug Superman, uh, don't go to a theme park. It's as simple as that, right? It, these are environments that are high risk for transmission of diseases. In general, colds, flus, anything would have spread through these parks and always did. So you need to understand that the little changes that things are gonna be around the edges are for the greater good. And either put up with it, enjoy the changes that you like, like spacing in grounds, or just don't go. My video all about theme parks after COVID. Please leave a comment in the section down below. What do you think? Do you agree with the changes that are being made? Do you think it's crazy that Australians are walking around without masks? Uh, do you think it's realistic what I've said about what parks overseas are going to do? Uh, are we going to lose buffet restaurants forever? Leave a comment in the section down below. Tell me what you think. I'll be back uh, later in the month to give my monthly theme park news update. So tune in for that. In the meantime, check us out on Twitter at Theme Park Nut, on Instagram, Theme Park Nut, Insta, or our blog is ThemeParkNut.com. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, cheers.